So, uh, so I'm going to speak on this clinical practice guidelines, what is new. And, uh, and we can never forget and thank the founder members who had this vision and who continue uh, to guide us even till date after 25 years. Usually people get lost, you know, or they lose that uh, touch with the society. But IMS has been one where you see Dr. Atul Munshi being there and always been there as a pillar for Dr. Jignesh. So it's just that selfless kind of a work that has been going on with all the people who have been involved in the IMS. And I think that ethos will continue from what we foresee. And thank you everybody for that again. So when it comes to menopause, it has to be like a radiant Indian summer, not something very cold and very disheartening. But then, you know, people used to always ask earlier, earlier on in life, when we were going for talks, we used to hardly have about 10 people in the audience when, when we used to talk about menopause. And they used to say, why should we even be worrying about menopause? It is a normal developmental experience. Is it some pathology that we need to treat it? Don't do that. But then we know better just like menopause is something similar to the different phases of a woman's life. Are we not treating adolescent problems? Are we not treating uh, reproductive uh, during pregnancy? In fact, pregnancy has become a big thing now. It's now glamorized and it has become so expensive. So I feel we are glamorizing certain places where we should not and we should pay more attention to places we should be. So menopause is actually a potential endocrinopathy. Is a endocrinopathy where some people develop problems and many of us sail through it without a problem. So nature guides best when guided. So what is religion and what is science? Religion, we strongly believe in religion and religion is actually, you know, like my father used to always say, you cannot see God, but you should have faith. So you don't see something, but then you should have faith. That's very difficult for a scientist. But science is always questions evidence. So unless you have evidence, there is, no, there is nothing that you can do about it. You need evidence in today's world. So the only thing that is constant is change. And that's how we are changing. But I feel the only definite thing is death. Even birth is not definite. A, a soul can come into the womb. But how many souls really transform into, into a human being? So even that is not definite. The only thing is definite, but can this death be postponed? Or the, can the quality of life be improved? So these are some very questions when you are doing with menopause, you're doing with menopausal women, they do go through your mind. So today we are in the uh, uh, phase of evidence-based medicine. And this is an accepted scientific clinical practice. But yes, there are caveats even in this. Clinic, where is clinical appearance? Dr. Rama always says, clinical experience cannot be neglected in this whole evidence-based practice. So there is a new terminology which people talk about that is called evidence farming. That is local evidence through the systematic collection of clinical experiences. So collection of all our experiences put together. It is also very effective because even in evidence-based, there are so many caveats when you look into just like what the WHI has done. It was an RCT, but then imagine the havoc it created for the last 10 years, 15 years, and today we can be, we are better poised with what the hormones does to the body. So guidelines actually are a method of translating the best available evidence into clinical, communicable, organizational and policy-making statements. Finally, all this is done to improve the healthcare or to improve the policies. And this is what we need to understand. So in the guideline, I remember in 2012, when we were uh, kind of putting it all together, we used, to, I, we used to communicate so much with all the contributors. And I remember speaking to Sonia and saying, Sonia, I'm going to put in all the little, little um, chap, uh, collection of uh, material that we have had throughout in the souvenirs. So uh, whatever, people have presented from the souvenirs i'm going to put them all in and it's going to that's going to be our evidence because we don't have huge evidences but whatever little evidences are going into the book and that is how we have done you know so we have put in all the evidences from the souvenirs souvenir based uh, data that we have had so we have got all of them in the book even in 2012 and we are continuing to do so in 2020 um, uh, uh, though this may not be really that accepted in the uh, western world but i think it's very important for us to understand that these clinical um, uh, collection of uh, material by the postgraduates by the doctors anywhere is so important to understand our problems to come out with solutions for our our women so guidelines actually they bridge the gap between evidence-based and experience-based practice and innovative programs India IMS has done is doing a wonderful job of running menopause clinics 35 plus clinics and the IMS MHCC program 
and it is really enhancing bed skills, but we need to audit. So we have to audit our work. And I think that's where we have to really work in the next couple of years, where we have to maintain the uniformity of statements and publications. So here, a word of caution that whenever there is a publication, please remember, please remember that we need to go through the PRTF and we have to see to it that there's a uniformity of statements and books don't come up like that in a month or two. It takes a long time to come out with a quality uh, publications and I wish the IMS continues to do so. And finally, that is because I menopause uh, itself is a gray area where there are a lot of controversy. So we should be coming out with clear statements, which doesn't confuse the doctors or the professionals when they come up with the treatment for the, for the women. So finally, it is improving health outcomes. And uh, uh, like uh, Dr. Jignesh said, the first consensus was on HRT by Dr. Urvashi. And uh, the first three consensus documents were by Dr. Urvashi. And the first was in Delhi. I still remember, I remember, and luckily I was a part of all of them. And I think that exposure, that exposure to how Urvashi did these guidelines definitely helped me formulate this particular one and 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 I thank her for that she was an ex she is an excellent academician and uh, and I think the third guideline Sonia was very actively involved in that and this again was in Delhi and all these actually have been firm basis for the guidelines that we have today not to forget the modules which Dr. Saroj also developed in her tenure for the CIMP. But there was a difference because with time, we have to change, we have to improvise, we have to improve. The clinical practice guidelines in 2012-13, we went a little step ahead and we did put in the, the, the grade kind of more, uh, recommendations because that, that compels us to look into the randomized trials, observational trials, experimental trials, and then we grade the statements that we're going in. So when we came out with the executive summary, each statement which was there was graded. So grade A would mean that further research is unlikely to change the statement that we have made. Grade B is further research may make an impact and there may be a change in the statement that we have made on that time. Grade C is further research is most likely and this is only a collection of uh, data that we have collected and the thought process of, uh, um, uh, of all the individuals that is there. It is a consensus kind of uh, statement for, on that particular issue at that particular point of time. Grade D is we are very uncertain about the estimate and a lot has to be done in this particular area of work. So actually grading helps in many ways. It gives authority into the statements. It also gives a food for thought and areas which we really need to work on. So it's very, very important. So the clinical practice guidelines today, I thank my co-chairs, the external review board for being there for while doing these guidelines and the peer review task force, the entire task force uh, who also have come, uh, put in their uh, uh, invaluable comments when we were doing the um, executive summary and the resource faculty, I thank each one of them for uh, giving their time during the making of 2012 and little editions during this 2020. Guidelines. And this is how it looks like. It has got a new flavor. And uh, this is how it appears uh, the, in, in the book. And uh, the, the, what is new and what is updated. So I just wanted to concentrate on what is new because not much has changed. What has changed is a lot on the hormone therapy, but there has also been a lot of new information, especially where the PCOS is concerned, the endometriosis, the fibroids at menopause, hyperandrogenism at menopause. And I think one area where, I, uh, where there is a good change is the clinical evaluation at menopause because here we, now we are more clear as to how to approach a lady at menopause. And I think this is where needs to be uh, to, go, to, to go to the professionals because that helps them run a menopause clinic well. It, it it's kind of gives you a guideline on how to run a menopause clinic. Postmenopausal bleeding, there's a lot of information on endometrial hyperplasia, which is there is a lot of information there with new information on endometrial hyperplasia, which is a day-to-day -day problem for the gynecologist. And hormone therapy, the entire chapter has been revamped. There is a lot of information on frailty and sarcopenia, cancer endometrium, progesterones, and we have actually changed the names of some of the titles. Earlier it was insulin resistance at menopause. Now the topic goes as metabolic changes at menopause. And there is a new topic called microbiome, 
at uh, menopause and included in the nutrition chapter in nutrition and i would like to thank sonia because she has been working on this topic i requested her to give me um, to write on this and she has consented very gracefully within a very short period of time and we have put that in and now we don't no longer call premature ovarian premature menopause we call this term the term is premature ovarian insufficiency and i would urge each one of you all to now switch over from premature there is a lot of good reasons why the switch over is there these are the hra guidelines and and finally not the least are the pathways a quick reference when you don't have time to read the entire book you are a busy clinician perfectly understandable but have the pathways if you want to do menopause work the pathways can be in a form of small booklet which you put it on your uh, table and have a quick look whenever you are uh, doing a menopause clinic there are about 19 pathways on different aspects of menopause and finally the prescription writing at menopause is just a two page thing which gives you a good information on how to write a prescription so th yeah. these are some of the changes that we have made in this new guideline but coming to it when there are so many guidelines all over the world there are there is a guidelines from the international menopause society nams soc and australia and some some more of them but do we need country specific guidelines that was a question now yes definitely we need we have 140 out of 1.3 billion people in india 140 million over the age of 50 and i am very impressed with what parag has said yes it is a silent epidemic and we need to take care we need to not take care first we need to Uh, condition ourselves we have to learn we have to start doing as to whenever a woman walks in after the age of 40 years what is it that we are going to offer this woman the age as we see the lifespan has changed today the average age a woman can expect to live is 73 years and it is going to increase more we now have people living up to 80s 90s and 95 100 both my my mother and my mother in law are, are around that age you know 90 95 so we have so many families with the older generation and we need to be sensitive in the sense it's not age are we just looking at an age or are we looking at a quality of life i think quality of life is more important it's not just the age because we don't want longevity we want we don't want disability and when you look at the figures in india you would agree with me that it is definitely very very important to have our own guideline metabolic syndrome at perimenopause is 23% and it's almost 48% at postmenopause and you know that means the nicd sets in so insidiously during this menopause transition and where preventive measures can be taken care of 30% of the asian indian adolescent with normal bmi and worse circumference at hyperinsulinemia so actually it starts off much earlier myocardial infarction also occurs at a much younger age in the asian women compared to the european type 2 diabetes occurs a decade earlier and here we have a different phenotype it is the lean phenotype where when you just do the bmi that person may look absolutely normal but when you look at the waist circumference don't forget to do the waist circumference these are the things that we have actually uh, we want to enforce in the clinical evaluation that it's not just the bmi you don't have to do, do the waist hip ratio at least to do the waist circumference for all the people and you will be picking up a problem 25 years ago 70% of our breast cancer patients were above the age of 50 years but now 50% of them are below the age of 50 years and they are also hormone positive and this is without actually using the mht so there is something much more which is acting in india which is not mht and the increase in hormone positive breast cancers and one of them major thing is obesity which we need to look into uh harinder this is yeah so the trends in breast cancer as you see the trends in breast cancer as you see we are very very happy with what we have done what the obstetricians and gynecologists the foxy and uh, the uh, the interest groups in cancer cervix they have done with the cancer cervix there is a decline over a period of years whereas the breast cancer the endometrial cancer both related to lifestyle whether it is alcohol whether it is obesity and the, the they are on the increase and this is where all of us need to pay attention so implementation it's not just about knowing it's implementation and actually small implementation measures with each one of us at our clinic is going to bring about a huge difference that is we know the modifiable factors are 
the parity, the obesity, the physical inactivity, diet high in saturated fats, viral infections, HPV, promote vaccination, uh, control of uh, H. pylori just by course of antibiotics. It's so simple. Hepatitis B vaccination is so simple. Check for hepatitis C and follow the screening guidelines and practices which are available today to us by the FOXI and by the uh, focus groups in the um, ca uh, cancer survey. So I think that needs to be popularized. And uh, in the small study that uh, the IMS had done way back in 2012, hypertension figures very much, IHD, diabetes and hypertension are very, very important in the postmenopausal women. Now, not only the cardiovascular, look at the osteoporotic fractures, they occur 10 to 20 years earlier. So this is all about skeletal muscular health, what we have today in India, 10 to 20 years earlier. By the time the woman is 60 years, 60% 60 of our women are going to have low bone mass and about 30% of the women who also will have low muscular mass and 28% lower lean mass when compared to the Caucasians when you compare age wise. And when they have POI, we've been doing some body compositions. It's really amazing to see that the most, some of them would have low muscle mass at the age of 30 and 40. So lean muscle mass, low protein is a very important factor for these fractures and decreased skeletal muscular health at a later age. Indians have a higher percentage of fat. Now we're talking about uh, osteosarcopenic obesity. So, uh, the, so Indians actually have a deadly combination of all of them. We have got low bone mass, we have low muscle mass, we have low protein, and we are obese, metabolically obese. That is obesity in the visceral area. So all of them make a deadly combination for uh, skeletal muscular, poor skeletal muscular health. And hip fracture rates are very high. And vertebral fracture rates uh, are almost to the tune of 25% by the time a, a woman uh, becomes, uh, say, around the age of 60. And there are good studies from the ICMR and from studies from Dr. Hari Narayan, where they have shown that an average Indian woman takes about 250 milligrams per day of calcium, which is absolutely, this is also in the urban, not only in the rural area. So we need to consider, when you're considering all these factors, we are different from the Caucasians. So, so what do we do? we have to have our own guidelines we have to so that is the reason why the indications for uh, de bone density is very very different that means we have to actually start doing wherever possible screening for osteoporosis have to start right from the age of 40 years that is you're using the screening tools which i'm going to talk about but then after once you have done the screening tools to reference for dexa referral for dexa is all those high risk people that you have picked up there and second is all menopausal women more than five years of menopause in the iof they say after after the age of 65 but when we are dying at the average age of dying is 71 what's the point in doing screening at 65 it doesn't make sense so we have to start doing screening after the age of five years after menopause all postmenopausal women, even less than five years of menopause with high risk factors like so thyroid is so common, diabetes is so common, steroids, all those arthritis. So, so many risk factors are there. So all these women, POI is an indication for DEXA at any age. Women in menopause transition with all secondary causes. And if you find an evidence of osteopenia on an incidental X-ray, please go ahead and do the DEXA. So we have two good studies from uh, uh, the Indian Menopause Society, which say that the average age is 46. And of course, there are a number of studies which have been published in the journal as well as what was done before the journal had come in. And all of them uh, actually average in the age of menopause is 46 years, but there is one lacuna. You know, we still need to have population studies to come out for this average age of menopause. Why do you think this age is important? Because from the POI studies and from the studies where the ovaries have been removed at whatever age, and there is so much of material all over the world, we say that age does matter. Age at menopause does matter because later age at menopause gives you a greater life expectancy, a good, better quality of life, reduces the all-cause mortality, reduces the risk of cardiovascular disease, reduces the risk of osteoporosis and fracture. So that estrogen, the amount of estrogen that is needed for that particular period of time is very, very important. So this courtesy, Dr. Rama Vaidya, this she had brought, taken this, she got this from one of her colleagues, Dr. Sudha Sani, which uh, I tried to trace uh, in 2010. And this is a beautiful slide, actually, if you look into this, uh, what, what this doctor did, she studied the effect of IUGR on fetal ovaries. And what she found in normal oocytes and uh, uh, the primordial follicles look like this. But in IUGR cases where the babies were lost, when she did the 
uh, sections, what she found, the number of primordial follicles were less, apart from the ballooning degeneration which is present. So somewhere, IUGR and nutrition. So nutrition plays such an important role in, in utero. And we as gynecologists dealing at menopause, dealing with women at pregnancy, we can do so much. We start counseling right from the preconception to have a good nutrition. So we start or we nib all these NICDs right from in utero or before in utero. So implementation is a good pre-pregnancy and pregnancy care. So menopause, the Indian challenges that we have is earlier median age of menopause, high prevalence and early onset of diabetes and all the disorders. We have to redefine POI and delayed menopause for our population. There is an early onset of de declining fecundity and a dietary excesses and deficiencies, not only the macronutrients, but we know the micronutrients, especially the calcium, vitamin D, B12, and folic acid. And we have a dominance of non visomotor symptoms. And there is the widespread use of complementary and alternative medicines which are not standardized. So these are all the things that we need to deal with. And, and everything is paid out of pocket. So there is no government subsidy, especially for menopausal health for the, for the, for the, the medicines. In the last um, essential group meeting by the government, we were trying to push in uh, AMHT as an essential, but I think it's still not done. So the cost is somewhere around rupees 500 to 1000, which is quite a bit for an average Indian to spend so much of money, if at all somebody needs estrogen replacement therapy. So these are all the areas that we need to really work on. But then they, we also, Indians also have good strengths. First and foremost is like I said, it's not all about science and evidence. It is about our faith, our traditional mindset, our culture, our close family ties, our diet, our lifestyle. We have so much of fresh food in plenty and we have so many people to help us out. And we ourselves are always into fresh cooking and most importantly, our spiritualism, our faith. And for us, any part of aging or any anything that happens in our life, we accept as a natural part of life. That is God's will. So maybe there is a very positive side to thinking like that you know, right? So I just put in this very nice Brahmanical age, the way they have put it in the Vedas. So aging is not a decay. So for us, menopause, we always have a positive attitude. It's not a decay, but it's an enrichment of the soul. And it's an enrichment of the mind with time. There are four stages which have been prescribed in early Vedic age. And I think it really stands good even today. One is the Brahmacharya, that is the first 25 years where you are learning. The next is Grihastha. That means the reproductive phase of your life. Where today we have got the staging, uh, you know, scientifically. Now this whole thing is converted into the staging of a reproductive life. Where marriage is an important institution. Men without a wife and a son is powerless and incomplete because you need to propagate. Then Vanaprastha is detachment from your family responsibility. To be respected by the society and looked after by the younger ones is what they used to say. Sanyasa is beyond that. Live an aesthetic, aesthetic life and you're not dependent on anybody. So you have to be, you know, so for to achieve that independence, even in the sannyasa period, you have to start working on yourself much earlier in life. So, and, and there are some very good studies from India, which show that vasomotor symptoms are very much prevalent and non-dominant symptoms are very high. Genito-urinary symptoms are very much there and weight gain at menopause is a problem. So the guidelines first is very important is the menopause clinic and actually Jyoti in uh, the IMS newsletter 2007. I think this was the first time she came up in the world. I don't think anywhere this concept or how to set up a menopause clinic, you won't find a literature over there. And she very beautifully came out with the basic requirements. And then we have kind of now uh, with the help of Dr. Rama's ideas, we have said that it is at the primary level, what you should be having at the secondary level, what you should be having. So primary level, anybody, anywhere you can start a menopause clinic with very simple things at the secondary level probably you would need to include all the specialist things that would involve in a menopause care and also have visiting consultants who would help you out with comorbidities and this is the menopause performer and i think menopause performer is very very important document because you cannot practice menopause without having a documentation do we practice antenatal care without a, a document no we do have our documentation, every, you know, there is an inversion of the pyramid, but you see the woman regularly, you document in the first few months, and then you continue to do so postpartum as well. Similarly, menopause performer, once in a year, 
that woman needs to know what's happening to her in in that life so it's very very important not only for uh, helping her through the menopause transition but also trying to understand the problem document the menopause rating scale so when you're documenting the menopause rating sale, you understand what the menopause is doing to her. Does this woman need a treatment? What kind of a treatment? So there is a lot of information and you understand the woman in totality when you run through the menopause performer and you understand from the history, when was her last period and where are you going to place her? Is she in the pre-menopause? Is she in the late menopause? Or is she in the natural menopause? And this is going to help you plan your treatment. And it's 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 we are very extremely actually thankful to Dr. Ankil Eshwarya for his vision in that time. Even before the straw had come in, he had come out with a simple statement of staging of uh, menopause, which um, you know was, was published in 1996 along with Dr. Sonaji. Sonaji once upon a time was a very active member, and I still miss him. He was a good he's a good academician and we the ims actually has lost a very good worker uh, with him so they had come out with the staging of menopause at that time and later on it has been improvised by the indian menopause society which have given subdivisions in the staging but even at that time even before the whi had come into being he said stage one needs prevention and treatment only after the transition starts the treatment comes in and in the late stage it is more of a palliative treatment so that kind of a vision even before the WHI. So that's really wonderful. So menopause specialist and role that we have is we have to stage the menopause and stage the aging process and divide into two groups. Very simple. When a woman walks in, whether she's symptomatic, asymptomatic, what is the risk assessment for disease? Then you plan a management. A management needs to be planned. And there are two simple ways of doing it. Healthy with no symptoms, healthy with symptoms, and what are you going to do for each one of them is divided and is described very well. And the good mantra for menopause health is always starts from the mind. It's the mind, the hormones, the chemicals have an extremely important effect on the entire body. So we start with a therapeutic lifestyle management. It's your food, it is your body, it is your mind. Be positive. It's your sleep. We had an excellent review on sleep by Dr. Ramavai there at the inauguration. Sleep is important. Emotions and your emotions are so important. Mind your soul, your prayers, your positivity, whatever it is. And I think living life without expectation is something which gives you an immense satisfaction. And these two I have put up, these are our great timers, uh, or gynecologist from Hyderabad. So I've just put it there. It gives me an immense satisfaction to have them in there. And mind body exercises, very, very important yoga or any kind of exercises that anybody likes. And simple guidelines, this can be actually handed over to your woman, which is very, very simple. Have about 500 to ml of uh, milk. There is about a glass of milk, vitamin C rich fruits and vegetables, protein one gram per kg, uh, less, not more than one teaspoon of visible salt in a day or that's very, very important because salt becomes very important. We have so many dietary sources of phytoestrogens. It's not just about soya. Soya, more than soya, we have the rajma. We have so many Bengal gram, which has so much of phytoestrogen. So these should be encouraged. And the turmeric, I think there is so much of anti-inflammatory effect on the turmeric after the COVID. We are realizing that all these good foods that we have in India should be popularized and I think we are doing quite good effort and menopause like I said microbiome the microbiome is the one which actually changes the picture of the clinical picture of a woman whether she is on hormone therapy or not on hormone therapy so this itself is a huge topic to be discussed now the WHO also so whatever we have put in the guideline there is a good amount of evidence people who are insufficiently physical active and an increased risk of fall cause mortality globally 28 percent of all adults had raised blood pressure and increased risk of heart disease because of excessive salt intake. So people who are taking more than nine to 12 grams of salt each day, it is it, that is what has been taken in India. It is twice the amount of what the WHO has recommended. That is about five to grams per day. So the RDF for calcium, there is a little change by the uh, NIN, the ICMR and the NIN. This year, they have changed the uh, requirement from 800 milligrams in a post women to 1200 milligrams per day. Vitamin D remains the same 400 IU, but uh, our Indian guidelines have put it as 1500 and 2000 and they have so many reasons we have put it like that. 
So whenever you are in the patient, do not just assume. There's a very simple calculator, which we have been talking about for the past five years, how simple it is to calculate the calcium which a woman is taking. And then you encourage these particular products, especially the ragi. Ragi has got about 100 grams, has got about 360 milligrams. So a simple ragi porridge every day, which is so cheap, so cost effective, horse gram. 100 grams gives you 270 milligrams. So horse gram, soya bean, of course, is there, the Bengal gram. So Bengal gram, instead of having rotis with only wheat, put in a little basin there and the rajma. So simple changes can make a huge difference in the quality of the health. So implementation is small effort, large dividends. This is what we're looking at. Now coming to hormone therapy, this of course is basically the, the evidence is based on the WHI. So nothing really has much is coming from India. So we have based all in the guidelines based on the WHI. So the three most beneficial effects, all of you all know, I'm not going to go into, but premature menopause, and ovarian early menopause. We were not talking about early menopause, but early menopause also is an important indication for hormone therapy. When you say early menopause, anything that's happened for us below the age of 45, because 46 years is expected age. So if, an, uh, if a woman is uh, having her menopause less than 45 years, even then, you can offer her hormone therapy, even if she doesn't have symptoms. So prescribing hormone therapy, all of you are well aware, I'm not going to go through this, but this is what I think a couple of slides, which I'm going to concentrate on is the risk assessment. So we are going, we, uh, we promote, we have promoted the use of Gale model, though we don't have our own, because we don't have any other model in India. And this model also needs to be validated. So it is actually better than, it, uh, better than nothing, because when you are prescribing hormone therapy, if the risk category comes out at low, at least you're confident that you you're prescribing MHT when you're prescribing MHT, because you can't sit and, you know, start wondering, okay, does she have even if she has one uh, family history of cancer, you can still give her an MHT if her risk category shows uh, row because it is a calculation of different risk factors put together. So you cannot do it on your own in the clinic, you know, put all the risk factors together and wonder whether to give or not to give. So this is a very good model, online model, which we can use to understand. Plus, it's not only about MHT. When you talk to them about the risk factors, if she's in the high risk category, then you can promote because we don't have any guidelines for screening of breast cancer. You can be more aggressive in promotion of mammography for these women. So this is the importance of risk assessment. And we know it's not just MHT, it is obesity, which has got 24 more cases, the absolute risk for breast cancer. When you look at all these factors relating to breast cancer, it is the obesity, it is the exercise which is more related to the increased incidence of breast cancer. So the risk of breast cancer with, uh, with the HT use, I would just like to you know uh, spend a little time over here uh, for the understanding that uh, this, this was a very interesting analysis of uh, hormone therapy use in the WHI data. When you look at this time in years and no prior hormone use. So this particular graph, uh, the ENP graph shows the uh, estrogen progesterone is in the blue and the placebo group is in the uh, pink. So use of hormone therapy over a period of time, there is a slight incre uh, this thing, uh, this thing, increase, uh, increase in the EHT uh, uh, shows. The, the similar graph is seen when a woman who has not used any hormone therapy and have been offered hormone therapy in the WHI trial, which is usually in the later phase. So this, this, is, this data is from the WHI. So what we have found, what they have found is there is actually a decrease in the placebo group. So that means to say that in a hormone nay woman, when they're offering hormone therapy, actually there was a decrease in the incidence of uh, breast cancers in these women versus, versus the increase. So what you saw was not an increase in hormone therapy, which is the same. When you look at this graph and this graph, no prior hormone use, any prior hormone use, the graph is actually growing, going down for the women who have never used hormone therapy. So there was a misinterpretation of data. Whereas when you look at the estrogen alone graph compared to the uh, placebo group, there was a decrease in breast cancer 
in the hormone therapy group. So the incidence is less than one per thousand women years per years of use. So this was a very interesting uh, uh, information that we got in the newer um, analysis of the WHI. And association of hormone therapy with invasive breast cancer, cumulative follow-up of 22 years. And this is what we, and I think a lot of information has gone into the guideline regarding the use of hormone therapy and breast cancer association. And what they have found is there is no increase with estrogen alone. In fact, the protectiveness is there. And in both the groups, whether it is estrogen or estrogen and progesterone, the all-cause mortality does not increase. So these are all very interesting uh, finding and analysis after 22 years of WHI analysis is an excellent, it's, it's come in the JAMA this year. So if anybody is interested, can go through it very well written. And how to, dis uh, so this we have added in now, I've just put in some snippets from the book, how to decrease the risk of breast cancer in women using hormone therapy. It's kind of a question answer and trends in breast cancer in India and Indian perspective is MHT a major risk factor. So this is all there in the book. And now coming to cardiovascular risk assessment, we have adopted the WHI ISH because this can be done by any paramedical. You don't need to be very, very savvy. You, you don't even need the internet. So this is a very simple chart which you can have in your uh, room, uh, in your clinic. And then it just talks about a few factors. One is the age, one is the sex, smoker, cholesterol level, diabetes or no diabetes. So once you have all of them, you can easily uh, chart out the, uh, assess, uh, you, uh, you can assess the woman for cardiovascular risk by, uh, and then you get this mild, moderate or high risk. And you always simultaneously assess the risk for um, VTE and, and classify them as uh, low or high risk simply by your uh, history. You don't even need to do any particular test. So this is the history that you're going to take. If a woman has gone through a pregnancy uneventfully, definitely she falls into the low risk uh, group. And once you have the risk group, you're very sure where you're going to offer the hormone therapy. Similarly, in breast cancer, low risk and moderate risk, you can offer hormone therapy. High risk, don't give hormone therapy. That's a contraindication. Similarly, cardiovascular disease, if she has got high risk, it is a contraindication. It's not only people who are suffering, but people who are got high risk for cardiovascular, MHT is contraindicated. Moderate risk, go for transdermal. So always assess for baseline risk. And obesity, again, features very, very important in VTE. And it's not just about MHT, it is obesity. Also, we have to look at when we are looking at the hormone therapy. Risk of stroke between the ages of 50, 59, it's very, very less. And if the woman is lean and has no risk factors, then it's absolutely safe. When it comes to the osteoporosis, what is the role of the gynecologist? Like I said, it starts right from utero. It, it is there throughout in the adult phase where you're achieving the peak bone mass at menopause transition and also at post-menopause. Only once she develops the fractures, then you have to hand, hand her over to your orthopedician colleague. So the risk assessment starts at the age of 40. So this is a beautiful OSTA tool. Only two variables that you have to look at. One is the age, one is the weight. That's it, plot it. And you know which where she falls. So if she falls into the low, medium or high, low, if it's, she falls into the low risk, you can be rest assured that only 3% of these women would really be, you would be missing that 3% of them would have a problem. So hormone therapy, it's not only for prevention. In the guidelines, even in 2012, we went against the tree stream and we had put in that it can be used for treatment in the early postmenopausal women. And I think we were the first in the world to make a statement like that. And today also, today, the rest of the, um, uh, uh, with, of course, with the evidence that has come in, uh, it, it is agreeable to say that it can be used as a treatment for osteoporosis in the early postmenopausal women. So DEXA forms a very important, this is at the secondary level, it's a complete one-stop evaluation of body composition. It gives you much more information rather than bone health. Bone health is one part of it, but it gives you the obesity, it gives you the visceral fat, it gives you the lean mass index, it gives you the resting energy expenditure. So you can plan treatment far better when you have all this information with you. And these are the other things that we have very important is the sarcopenia. So how do you look for sarcopenia? Very, very simple. If a woman is able to walk in very comfortably without support, she's able to sit up and get without support, she's able to climb stairs, then she doesn't have any sarcopenia. But any of these factors, then you have to go through the 
uh, uh, entire questionnaire. There is a fine five questionnaire, and these are the algorithms that are there in the book. And these are the variables that you have to look for. Not at all very difficult to diagnose sarcopenia. And once you have all this information together, you're just going to put it in that menopause performer. You're going to have this graph which we have inserted this time, where you're going to give the take the risk assessment for a five-year, ten-year lifetime score, and finally you're going to give a risk assessment for the breast, for the cardiovascular, for the bone, for the muscle. In fact, for the genitourinary is what I thought we should be adding. And that would actually give you a complete assessment of a woman in these five columns. And then you plan your treatment. It's as simple as that. So genitourinary sy syndrome, everybody should have this pH stick in your, take it from your lab and have that and always try to do it. And it gives you so much of information and you can plan your treatment so well. So to diagnose is very, very easy. I just ask those questions, check objective signs, three things that you need to do. And the, the guidelines, as we had in 2012, nothing has changed. The only thing that has changed is the confidence with which we can say, yes, you can use it for a longer time. The nurses health study, the WHI study have used for three years. So now it's not just one year, you can use it for three years and there is no, and safety data has come in from the collaborative group, from the so many other longitudinal studies they have said, Vaginal estrogens don't cause any NICDs nor cause breast cancer. So recurrent urinary tract infection also, it does help. And uh, this is the prescription writing uh, uh, page that we have in the book. And uh, the, the new things that are there is understanding the biology of estrogens, the potency, the bleeding problems on MHD, how to investigate, how to solve them. And a very interesting that we have added this time is a timing of hormone therapy window of opportunity. And that is not restricted only to cardiovascular. We have included how diabetes can be prevented at that window of opportunity. The effect on the bone, on the uh, endometrium, on the breast, when you're starting very early. So therapeutic timing, timing uh, hypothesis is not just limited to CVD, but extends to the other ones. And I think near future, we may also get more information on the G GUS. And there is a segment on serum estradiol. And we have a lot on the body composition. We have the pathways. This is also gone as a change the, in, in uh, premature ovarian insufficiency because we have new data. And of course, the entire uh, MHT has been based on this WHI from the 2002 to 2018 as the data has been analyzed, as the, uh, as the literature has come in. We have just collated all this newer literature and put it there together. And for the progesterone, there is a massive change. Now it is the, there is nothing like the lowest dose for the shortest period of time. It is an effective dose, which is more important. And the role of progestins versus progesterone. So it's the natural progesterones. It is the diadrogesterone, which are the ones which have to be used at menopause and liver or gestrol, wherever there is an indication. And in the WHI, very clearly has shown it works excellent for the hot flushes and vulvovaginal atrophy. And this time in 2020, all fractures, there is an increased number the decrease in colorectal cancers, all cancers, mortality, and a significant decrease in diabetes type two when you're using a hormone therapy at the window of opportunity. So all this has gone into the book. And I, uh, I, uh, one, I'm a great fan of Morris Rotolvitz. His writings are fantastic. And this is something like what Dr. Ankaleshadia has given as to when, when we start primary prevention, when we do secondary, and when we do the post-event therapy. So the way forward is dissemination to a larger group of doctors, specialty menopause clinics akin to antenatal clinics in the private and public sectors, developing management of menopause as a medical specialty within obstetrics and gynec care, and of course, provide a resource to aid the busy clinician in extending optimal care to the aging woman. And I really look forward to Neelam's dream of having the WHO along with the WHO for the paramedicals and the primary practitioners. We should be able to reach them. And uh, this dream has to come uh, uh, into a reality, Dr. Neelam. And I end with the saying, fit at 40, strong at 60, independent at 80. Thank you so much for the patient hearing.